If I were to go close to you, I don't have a wireless mic, but yeah, maybe. If I go to you and ask you, how is your heart? How, you, how would you answer? How is your heart? Well, it all depends. If I were to, you know, go to somebody older, like me, <laughs> 40 to 50 year old or above, I go to you and I ask you, how's your heart? Probably you will, answer, you will immediately think of what? Cholesterol and triglyceride. Because we are advancing in age and we talk about the heart in a physical sense. We want to take care of our heart, make it healthy for us to live long. So for us, our heart is something precious that will keep us alive. But if I were to go to one of the young people here who are still single, and then I ask them, how is your heart? How do you think they would answer? They'll talk about their love life. So if somebody, if they're courting somebody or somebody's courting them and it's good, then they have joy in their heart. But then if their courtship and relationship is going down, then they're experiencing heartbreak. For them, the heart is something, a symbolic thing that, you know, produces the biggest emotional outburst, which is love. For them, it is a symbol of their love. Now, a heart doesn't actually have emotions. It's just a symbol. But still, we look, when somebody says heart, we immediately think of what? A source of our emotional feeling. If you were to read the Bible, not only is the heart projected as something which is emotions, they also uh, you know, relate the heart as a symbol of a place in our lives, in our body, where we invite somebody to come live in it. And who is that person? Jesus. Gee, we, we invite Jesus into our hearts, and then we say that in our hearts there are lots of rooms, and you have to give Jesus the access to every room in your heart. And what else? Uh, the heart is also... Ah, I forgot. But then also, Jewish believers, or us as believers, we, only, we not only see the heart as a center of our emotions, but also the center of our will. What do I mean? The heart is the source of where we get, where we base our actions and desires, whether to do this or not to do this. Why do I keep on thinking about the heart, talking about the heart? Because our heart is symbolically telling people whatever is in our heart, whatever we allow into our heart influences the way we behave the way we think of things, and the way we make our choices. Now, I ask you again, how is your heart? If scripture tells us that the heart influences big time or has a big role in, you know, controlling our heart, to which direction to take, and then God says, for us to be here on earth, the purpose of our lives when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, what Jesus wants us to do is to become more Christ-like. So if the heart plays a big factor in our lives, in the way we live our lives, and then the Bible tells us, God tells us that we have to live towards Christ-likeness, how is your heart? Is your heart leading your life towards Christ-likeness? Or has your heart stagnated and is starting to rot? Are we allowing our hearts to influence us? Are you filling up your hearts with the wisdom of God or the garbage of the world? Now, it's your choice. It's your choice. You can walk away, you can live yourselves, live your life in such a way that you don't care about what God is telling you, and you plan to just zone out from this message, don't. There's something for you as we go further. Now, for those that are into Christ-likeness, you love God, you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then the Bible tells us to become more Christ-like, and you want to you need to know how. 
So we're going to go together into scripture in our passage for today to see if we have what it takes to have a growing heart. What do we have to do? What do we have to change so that our heart is bringing us towards Christ and not the other way around? So let's open our Bibles or apps to Proverbs 4, 20 to 27. And we'll find out what's inside of you will show outside. So from Proverbs 4, 20 to 27, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. This is Solomon writing to his son. So Solomon is telling his children, his sons, and also us to listen carefully, pay attention to what he has to say. Why? Because it is very, very important. What we choose to listen to, listen carefully, what we choose to listen to or, you know, direct our attention to plays a big role in determining how we choose to live our lives. You get me? What you listen to, what you heard, what, did, what somebody told you, what the TV is saying, what YouTube is showing to you, whatever you listen plays a big role in how you live your life. Now, the lesson here is not hearing. The lesson here is hearing a heart action. That's what listen here is talk, the meaning. If we listen to the world, chances are we will follow what the world tells us. A lot of people these days, not only the young people, makes this excuse that they have a short attention span. They claim, or we claim, that we can only listen or pay attention maximum of 30 minutes. Anything over 30 minutes, our brain shuts down, we stop listening, and then what? We think of something else, or what movie to watch. That is why the church limits us to 30 minutes of sermon. Now, I'm going to ask you something. If you are making this excuse of a short attention span, why are you still watching movies? How long is a movie? There's some, there's none 30 minute movie. TV may run series. Some movies, three hours. Did you fall asleep? Did you think of something else while watching a movie? No. Your eyes are gazing on the screen you're listening, and then after the movie, oh, that was a good movie, right? How many of you here goes out of here and says, oh, that was a good sermon? Well, if it's me, then. <laughs> How long do you watch Netflix? Oh, my wife is gonna strangle me. Whenever I open Netflix and I want to take my chance of watching something, the suggestions are all Korean. And I distinctly remember that I never watched even one Korean Netflix show. So whoever is guilty, yeah, we need to stop making excuses. The reason why we stop listening is not because we have a short attention span. Let's be honest with ourselves. The reason why we stop listening is because we don't care about God's word. Yes, I admit. There are a lot of times that I have, I have been boring here, and God will deal with me. But don't let my shortcomings here in the pulpit stop you from listening. You have to keep on listening. Your responsibility is to listen, no matter how hard it is. You have to keep on listening and search in your heart the precious gem of wisdom that God wants you to take home with you. 
the moment you feel that I'm getting boring, you pray immediately. What do you need to pray for? You pray for the Holy Spirit to start a spark in your heart to make you kind of like shock you all alive and listen to what God wants you to say. Don't use the excuse of you having a short attention span. Why do I have to do that? Because what we choose to listen to governs how we live our lives. Oh, and the, as you listen to God's word, as you listen to his wisdom, when choices come in your life and it comes really, really fast and many choices are to be made in a day, you use what you have learned, you use what you have listened to, you use what you have believed in to make a correct choice. If a path comes into the picture, you're walking along, I'm using the analogy again, as you're walking along the path towards Christ-likeness and there's a diversion, it breaks into two. Do you know which one to take? If you choose to follow God, you have to know that at the end of the path that you choose, the destination is Jesus. No matter how hard the path is. How do you know that it's a correct path? You have to listen and pay attention to anything that deals with Christ-likeness. From your pastor to your small group leader, even uh, Sunday schools, even when you read the Bible, look for the direction that God wants you to take. Because if you don't do the things that God designed for you to do or prepared for you to do, you're wasting your life. You're wasting your life. It's as if buying something from a department store and then just putting it on display and you are not using it to make juice. Right? If you buy a juicerator, what do you do with it? You make juice. If you don't make juice from a juicerator, what use is the juicerator for? If God created you to become a disciple maker and you just sit at home watching Netflix and you're not making any disciples, what good is your life? Eventually, when you get to go to heaven and then Jesus asks you, I place you in that classroom. I place you in that office for you to influence your classmates or your office mates. What were you doing? You can say, Lord, I missed that. Can you make me alive again so that I'll do it all over again? One life, one chance. Now, Solomon also says, guard your heart. Above all, guard your heart. Why did he say that? Because the heart is deceitful. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? It's not always easy to tell if what we are feeling is the right thing. We need to guard our hearts against simply believing what you hear without bringing it to the test. I know that I told you a while ago that you have to listen carefully and pay attention so that you know what to put in your heart. But it is also crucial that whatever you hear, you test it out first if it's true. You don't simply just put it into your heart. How do we do that? Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divi dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You bring what decision that you have to make. You bring what you heard, what you listened, what you paid attention to, to the Word of God, to the Bible. Because we have been living in this corrupt world as Christians. And tendency is when you read something, a commandment in the Bible of what God wants you to do, we tend to, you know, kind of like mix it up with how we live in this world. For example, in the Bible, it is a big sin to lie. Do we still lie? The moment you open your eyes, sometimes we just blurt it out. And the thing is, when we lie, most of us, I'm not going to say everyone, most of us, if we blurt out a lie, we don't feel guilty. Admit it. I'm going to admit it myself. 
when I tell a lie, hmm, okay lang. But the Bible is really against lie. And sometimes you'll see Abraham lied, Isaac lied, but that's not an example for us to follow. The way the Bible is, it, it tells the truth. Even the bad things about what we usually hold high, what person we hold high on, like Abraham. Father Abraham or something, something, but he does a lot of things that are sinful. The Bible is n never lying when it comes to the real behavior of their patriarchs. What else? As long as I don't do it, as long as I just think of it, it's okay. That's wrong. You bring it to the Bible and what does it say? The moment you call your brother a fool, you're committing murder. The moment you glance at a girl or glance at a boy, I don't know if, you, if the girls glance at boys and say, ooh, a macho. Wow, pogi. And then it goes beyond that into thinking lewd thoughts. What does the Bible say? For us to say, nandito lang naman eh. It's all in my head eh. I didn't, you know, commit anything. I didn't put it into action. But what does the Bible say? When you lust after someone, you have committed what? Adultery. We need to be diligent. We need to be alert to what we allow, what we heard into our hearts. Because our heart is the wellspring of life. When I show you this picture, what do you think of? Where you're going after... <laughs> How many of you here still likes to go on excursions and meet different people now that the virus is, you know, spreading around? How many of you are going to the restaurant later for lunch? Changes your perspective, right? I'm, I'm going away from the sermon again. The wellspring of life, if you're going to see it, it's something good, something refreshing, something that's pure to drink. If the source is clean, but our source comes from the world. Before we become Christians, before we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our wellspring is not a wellspring. Our wellspring is Estero ng Chinatown. Have you seen Estero? Have you smelled it? Have you drank it? Of course not. Why should I? We, as people we start out with a dirty water all the sins in the world piling up so instead of refreshing we don't dare drink it we don't even dare smell it now uh, my kids well two of my kids always go to Binondo Halos every day for work and sometimes I'm with them I don't even dare look down at Estero what can purify us what can purify us? We need to be connected to a source that is pure, that is good, that refreshes us. And that's Jesus. Remember in Exodus, I think it is Exodus 5, uh, Moses took the Israelites out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea and then they started to get thirsty because after crossing the Red Sea, three days, they had no water. How many of you here likes to drink water? These guys went through three days with no water to drink. And it's not like this smaller congregation. Moses was bringing three million people across the wilderness with no water to drink. Can you imagine 300 complainers? Moses, where's the water? Where's the water? You brought us out of Egypt. Egypt has water. You brought us out to let us die of what? Thirst? And then they see a pond of water called Mara. Can you imagine? Three million people, three days no water, and then suddenly they see a body of water, a pool of water. What do you think they would do? They would rush to it, pushing people aside, kneeling down, taking a, a handful, and then take a big sip. And then what happened? The water was bitter. Mara, Mara means bitter. 
Ay, kawawa talaga. I don't know how Moses must have felt, right? So what, when Moses cried out to God, what did God say? Take this piece of wood, throw it in the water, and it will become refreshing, clear. Pwede na. Our source of water is not pure. Our source of water is not pure because we still entertain what the world tells us to do. It's hard to take rid of the garbage if you keep on piling it up. You have to make a decision to stop the world from piling trash into you. Jesus is the source of our clear water. Because as Moses was instructed to throw a piece of wood into Mara to make it sweet, you need to throw into your heart the cross made of wood to clear up what's in your heart. You cannot do it alone. Read the word of God. Listen to what God wants you to do to purify your heart, to be able to drink it. What's the purpose of purifying our heart? It is so that a wellspring, source of water, provides also direction. So as the wellspring of your heart flows out to your whole body, you will not only know God's will, you will not only know which direction to take, but it will provide you with the strength and the peace that you need to go through this life before Jesus comes. And because you are using your wellspring to bless yourself because you are obedient to God, you will also bless others. What do I mean? There will be situations in your office, in your school, in your business, or even at your home that you'll go through something and then they will be observing you. They will observe how you handle the difficulty that is in your life. They will observe how you respond when the office or the office manager treats you unfairly. And what has been blessing you because you're utilizing the pure waters of your wellspring will bless them too. All the unbelievers in your office. Then they will ask you, why are you still smiling? It's because of our wellspring. It's tapped into a source that is pure and refreshing. How is your wellspring right now? To purify something like that, we cannot do. We have to attach ourselves to Jesus, as I always keep on saying. But then we need to, in our own decision, in our hearts that is full of trash, to, you know, give out, no, throw away the trash that is in us. Because if you keep your trash, how can God, Jesus, fit in? By the way, the goodness of a wellspring is talking about God's promises and commands. So how can you fit the promises and commands of God when your heart is full of trash? You have to get rid of them. You have to get rid of them. I don't know what you're going through, but if you have a sinful habit, it will only take another habit to push it out of your heart. Trash and something good do not mix. The more trash that you have, the more people will not smell the goodness. If you put a perfume beside a trash of Smoky Mountain, you cannot smell the perfume. You can smell the perfume when there are lesser trash and more perfume. Take away the junk of the world, keep on putting in God's goodness for you to have the wellspring of life that others will be blessed as well and not only you. How do we do that? When you hear a promise in the Bible or you hear a commandment from God, in the Bible, no matter how ridiculous it sounds, no matter how unreasonable it is, when Jesus says this and God says it, and then you try it out, and then because you tried it out, what God promised to do to you if you tried it out really was fulfilled, that is the gem that you're looking for. Because if you only listen, it becomes a fact, F-A-C-T. But a fact 
that is applied in your life will turn into truth. And that is what you want in your heart. That is the precious gem in your heart. So do that. The way to fill up your heart with the wellspring of life is obedience and trust. You hear something from the pulpit, you hear something from your small group leader, you read something in the Bible, don't keep it here. Try it out and you see the goodness of God in fulfilling his promise because you tried it out. That becomes truth, you put it in your heart. Keep on doing that and it will push the trash away. Now, when you go through this life, we usually like to feel good, right? Who here wants to feel uncomfortable? No one. We all want to ha enjoy life. We all want to be feel good. But not everything that feels good to you is according to God. Now, what do we guard our hearts against? We guard it against somebody who will go in and take away the good stuff. And you know who that is. Because it is an ongoing journey. Picture this. This is your heart. We'll start with 50-50, okay? 50% 50 trash, 50% goodness. You, about the faith in Christ. And this half will move. The more you put in about God's word, the more the trash will be put, pushed out. But the more that you expose yourself into the world, listening to what, is, what the world is enticing you, the trash fills up and the water is being pushed out. Be careful when you go out into the world. Satan will really push it out. Now, how do we guard our hearts? Aside from listening, Solomon also says that we can guard our hearts with our mouths and eye and feet. What do we mean by that? As we keep on listening, the sign that we are listening effectively is what comes out of our mouth, right? That is why Solomon says, put away perversity, corrupt talk, obscenities, vulgarities, provocative, suggestive, lewd words, lies, deceit, smooth talk, and the list goes on. Because if you claim to have a clean, pure heart filled with God's promises and goodness, and then you have a foul mouth, you're lying to yourselves. Because what's inside will show outside. I don't know, some of you here might not know this, but I have a really foul mouth. But then it just disappeared. I don't know. One of the miracles there, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, the foul mouth just stopped. But that's not for everyone. Some of us here might still, you know, like to say, no, I won't say it. That's one of the signs. Whether how much of God's goodness is in your wellspring. Okay? That was in Mark 7. All these evils come from inside. I'm reading the last verse. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. You cannot claim that you have a wellspring heart. You cannot say that your heart is filled with the goodness of God if what is projected out is entirely different from a, what a person should be, a Christian, a Christ-like Christian should be. So guard your hearts, watch your tongue. Because if you have selfishness in your heart, it's going to show in your behavior it will start with a thought, and then you will behave selfishly. But if you're a loving person, it will also show as well. So what is inside will show itself. Now, Solomon also says to keep our eyes straight ahead, fix your gaze before you to Christ. If my eyes aren't fixed to Jesus, guess what? I will be looking everywhere. And tendency is, we will look back. If you don't look at Jesus in front, you will look back at the life that you had before. Whether you want to admit it or not, I'll admit it na lang. Sometimes when I look back, there are things in my past that I enjoyed doing. 
And I'm sure each one of you also has something like that. And if I don't fix my gaze on Jesus and a tendency, I will look back to the life I had before and then my heart was tugged. Yun, come on, look at what I'm looking. That's dangerous. Because if I fix my gaze not on Christ, I fix my gaze at my, what I went through and then my heart follows and say, hey, let's do it again. Those were the good old days. Actually, it's not the good old days. But then our carnal selves say, nakakamiss naman yung ginawa natin noon. Do you remember when your, for those that are married, do, do you remember when your child started to learn to walk? Or for those that are not married yet, do you, do you still remember how you learned to walk? Like, picture this, a baby sitting on the floor. That's not a living room, but it's okay. Sitting on the floor, and then you, the dad, or you, the mom, came into the room, and then your baby sees you. They struggle to stand up, right? And then when they stand up, they usually do this, to balance themselves. And then they take their first step, they fall down. And then you encourage him, oh, come on, come on, come on. Come to papa or come to mama. And then the baby struggles to stand up again, takes the second step, wobbles, take the third with his arm stretching towards you with the biggest smile on his face. Because he knows that w when they reach you, they will feel so loved and so comfortable and so secure because you will hug him and they were smiling all the way. Remember that? Guess what? You're the baby. God the Father with arms outstretched encouraging you to take baby steps and walk towards him. And you know that when you finally reach God the Father you have it made. You're with the Father. And all the while that you're walking towards Him, your eyes are fixated to His. Your ears are listening to His encouragement that every time you fall down, He will lift you up for you to continue walking towards Him. If you do not keep your eyes on the prize, you will be distracted by the things, by the useless things of this world. You know the eye is the lamp of our body. Have you heard that? If you allow light to go into your eyes, you're, you'll be filled with light. If you allow the darkness to go into your eyes, your life is filled with darkness. Whatever we desire in this world starts with Seeing it, we see something, and it's so attractive. You decided that you want it, and then you get it. No, wait, you want it, you pursue it, you get it, you treasure it. When we covet something, we store that desire in our hearts, and that, will, that thing will keep on burning inside of us because we keep ourselves busy obsessing over things that won't matter in our lives. And we push away our relationship with God. You know, it's hard to focus on Christ. It is going to be a difficulty. Ladies, how many of you here buys and uses moisturizers? Raise your hand. Ladies, almost all. How many of the guys do it? You're in church, you're in front of God, don't lie. How many men? Ah, alam ko na yan eh. My question is, uh, what made you decide to buy a particular brand of moisturizer? What's a, what's a factor? Because I read someplace that the ingredients doesn't matter because actually moisturizers don't work. The only thing that moisturizers do is keep the, what they call this, the dampness or something inside so that it won't perspire out. 
right? And I heard from this guy that the most effective way of having young skin is to live healthy. He keeps on saying, what's inside will show outside. So if you have a healthy lifestyle, you watch what you eat, you exercise and everything, it will, your skin will simply glow. And moisturizers are just scams. I, I still use moisturizers, by the way. Uh, that's my, one of my secrets. But then what attracted you to that brand, really? One says aloe vera, one says something else, eucalyptus or whatever. Or were you attractive, attracted by the packaging? Uy, ang ganda ng bote. If I finish this moisturizer, I can put it on display. Do you know that the packaging is worth more than the content? Why? Because they really want to pull your eyes away to be attracted to their product. Right? I heard that some people, the way they choose stuff is to look at the most expensive stuff. Because they have this mindset of saying, you get what you pay for. So if there's a 10 peso moisturizer, which I, I'm sure there's no 10 peso moisturizer, and a 1,000 peso moisturizer, this guy will buy the 1,000 without looking at the ingredients or packaging because they must have a reason why they're selling it 1,000 pesos. Yeah, there's a reason. It's to fool stupid people like that. Don't be attracted to things that look good because remember this, Satan is the prince of lies, angel of light. Yeah, that's, what, that's the word I was looking for. Satan was the angel of light. Attractive. Do you know that he's the most beautiful of all God's creation? Still want to go shopping? Oh, let's go on. For where your tre heart is, there your heart. Ah, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is so true, because no matter how fantastic the packaging is, if I'm not into it, like moisturizers, if packaging is so attractive, I won't even take a second look. But but if you show me Magwills, I'll be standing there instead of looking there. So Satan knows what attracts you the most, so be careful. And then Solomon ends with, with the feet. He's, he says we need to make level paths for them. What's that all about? When you go into life, and you're walking along what God wants you to walk along, to reach him, to become more like Christ, you consider every step that you make. Not because you are in a narrow path, you assume that everything that you do is Christ-like. Every step that you make, every decision that you make, every choice that you make, you take time to pray and to look into scripture of whether it is talked about by God. And the way to do that is to digest what you heard, digest what you read, try it out, and then if it comes true, put it in your heart as truth so that the next time that you experience that same experience before, you know what to do. You got that? If we don't focus on Christ, we will be going all over the place. We will be walking right, we will be walking left. And remember this, if you're walking along the path to Christ-likeness, there will be people going the opposite way. It is normal. And these people, will not want to go to their destination by themselves. They will drag you with them. They will drag you with them. They would rather see you fail than see you successful. What do I mean? If you profess yourself as a Christian in your workplace, or if you profess yourself as Christian in school, they will make it their life's mission to embarrass you and your faith. Hey, let's go drinking. Hey, let's go, you know, pot session. Is there still pot session? I'm growing old. Take a whiff of cigarette. Try it. No harm done. It's not as if if you inhale just one puff, you'll suddenly have lung cancer. And then when you give in and you do what they want you to do, guess what they're going to say? Kala ko Christian ko. 
It's your job, your responsibility. Look at God as the goal whenever you're walking along the path and then may lubak or may something that will trip you apply God's words in it or bring it to the Bible to look for a solution and continue walking. If you see somebody walking the other direction, you do not allow him to pull you to their path. You have to be the one to grab him and pull him into your path. That means evangelism. We have to bring people to Christ. And the way to bring people to Christ, and the easiest way to bring people to Christ is if they are attracted to your wellspring. That it's clean, refreshing, and that's the answer that they're looking for. Remember, uh, you don't allow them to pull you in your, to your path. It is you that needs to pull them into their path. And as we journey on, we always make it a point to remember that Christ is walking alongside you. That would be the best. What are we doing this morning? All the Proverbs verses that you heard from different pastors, all of them end in the same meaning. We have to look for the wisdom of God. Why? We need the wisdom of God to live in this world. Can't I live the way I live? You can, but you don't want to experience what will come when you meet Christ. Now, I'm not saying that you will go to hell. There are Christians that don't live according to Christ. But then if you store yourselves up treasures in heaven, you will love what Christ is going to tell you when you meet him face to face. You know, <clears throat> what scares me the most is this. That when I go to heaven, I hear people hearing from Jesus' words, Jesus' mouth saying, good job. And then I go up there and said, oh, okay, I'm glad that you have accepted me as, my, as your Lord and Savior. Okay, you can go in, but no good job. Uh, we were, it's not enough for us to just become Christians. I'm treading on a small line here. I'm not saying that you do good works to be saved. Huh? I'm saying that good works, will, you will have treasures in heaven. What's the use of the treasures in heaven? Maybe you can come to me later on and ask me that because it's going to take another... Sorry, I cannot see the clock. <laughs> the lights were, are so bright. But then I'll talk about it in another sermon in the future. So the lesson for today, I sound like a teacher. What's inside will show outside. Please remember that. And above all, guard your heart. Why? Number one, it determines the course of your life, your heart. Number two, it shapes your thoughts and words. What you think of usually will manifest itself out. Whatever your heart is filled with, I pray and hope that it is God's promises and God's wisdom. If your heart is still filled with trash, move it aside. How do we move it aside? I'll say this before we end in prayer. How do we move it aside is fill it up with God's wisdom so that it will be pushed against whatever will, you know, push it out. And when you stop doing it, when you stop it entertaining, uh, here listening to Satan, it eventually will become, you know, boring for you. It will be pushed out. So read the Bible, apply what you heard, take away the trash. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much that uh, through the word, we finally realize, Lord, how we can live our lives. That not only leads us to Christ-likeness, Lord, but also glorifying your name. Lord, as we...
try to do what needs to be done. Lord, we ask that you empower us through the power of the Holy Spirit that we will be successful, Lord, in pushing out all those dirty things that is in our hearts and fill it up with your spring water so that while we are pursuing Christ-likeness, people will be attracted to what we are doing and get into the same path we are on, going to the same direction, which is your hug, your embrace, and your smile. Lord, we ask that you protect us. Once again, we pray for you to protect us from the virus that is going around. And we pray that we will go out today with a smile on our lips, no matter what we're going through, and joyfully, happily telling people about Christ. All this we pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.